this is all very exciting. This is very kind of New York, Hollywood, Jerry and Jen. This is really good. This whole little setup up here at Convene. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone, and good afternoon. And thank you uh, for joining us to celebrate the launch of the Dwayne Morris Class Action Review 2024. Uh, my name is Matt Taylor, and I'm the chairman of Dwayne Morris. Uh, besides uh, our live audience, uh, which is very healthy here in Philadelphia, uh, we are joined on Zoom by a nationwide audience, as well as some guests from overseas. We are so glad and grateful that you are here. This is, in fact, a very exciting day at Dwayne Morris, as we are, uh, I think, uh, justifiably very proud of this class action review. That's the hard work of many, which uh, Tom and others will get into. Um, how would one describe this one-of-a-kind publication? Of course, I ask that rhetorically. Well, it is a comprehensive analysis of class action litigation trends and significant rulings and settlements from the past year that will enable corporate counsel and business leaders to make informed decisions when dealing with complex litigation risks in 2024. The review is 650 pages long. It includes 23 substantive chapters with extensive charts and graphics and six appendices. It is designed as a reader-friendly research tool that is easily accessible in hard copy and ebook formats. The review also has a standalone website, which includes succinct high-level information, the top 10 trends in 2023, the top settlements in all areas of litigation, an executive summary, a video commentary. Take a look at it if you have yet to see it. It is an incredible three-minute tour of the class action world. The response from our clients and friends and the media has been incredible. It has been featured in over 250 news stories, including Forbes, Bloomberg News, the Corporate Council Magazine, just to name a few. For clients, this reference tool is already on the desks of corporate counsel and C-suite executives. In fact, Jerry sent me a note from a very large client of ours, very Fortune 100 company, from their general counsel saying that everyone and his team uh, wants a copy, and if they don't have a copy, they're going to get one. That was really impressive, Jerry, to see that note. Uh, it is quickly becoming the definitive guide for understanding the complexities of class action litigation. So that's it from me. I do want to make sure uh, I introduce the next speaker. Uh, and this is my dear friend, our dear friend, Tom Servadidio. Tom's the vice chair of Dwayne Morris. Uh, Tom himself is a preeminent employment and labor lawyer and has been for a long time. Tom's approaching, although his very youngish, boyish looks, uh, almost 40 years, 40 years at Dwayne Morris. He started as a summer associate almost 40 years ago. It's incredible. Tom was the longtime chair of our uh, employment labor group, what we call now ELBI. Um, he's uh, just a legendary Dwayne Morris lawyer, a great friend. He's now our vice chair. And he's not only a great lawyer, but he's a better person. So, Tom, why don't you take it from here? And uh, I'm going to listen intently to the great presentation. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Thanks, Matt. And what a delight to see you all and to be here today. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. First, I'd like to introduce uh, Commissioner Sonderling. First, um, by way of background, he was confirmed by the U.S. Senate with a bipartisan vote to be commissioner on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and that was in uh, 2020. Until 2021, he served as the commission's vice chair, and his term as one of the five EEOC commissioners expires this summer, July of 2024. Prior to his confirmation to the EEOC, Commissioner Sonderling served as the acting and deputy administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the Department of Labor, the U.S. Department of Labor. And before joining uh, the Department of Labor in 2017, he practiced labor and employment law in Florida. 
He also serves as a professional lecturer in law at George Washington University Law School teaching employment discrimination. And as I was thinking about that, I was saying, wouldn't that be an absolute amazing course to take? Um, I'll have to sign up for that one. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our partners here, Jennifer Riley. She's um, a, a vice chair of the Workplace Class Action Group. For more than two decades, Jen has defended companies across the nation when they've been faced with significant complex litigation matters. She has handled some of the largest class actions in federal and state courts all across the country. She's known for her thought leadership on class action issues and particularly impressive, one of the top 10 published attorneys in the country in this space. She's co-editor and author of the Class Action Review, one of our absolute top attorneys here at Dwayne Morris. And let me also introduce our partner, Jerry Matman. He's the chair of the firm's workplace class action group and co-editor and author of the Class Action Review. With nearly four decades of experience practicing law, Jerry has defended some of the most significant bet the company cases across the United States. Among these cases, Jerry has defended and defeated the largest systemic enforcement action ever brought in history by the EOC. He's also handled at the first attorney general prosecution of a Wall Street company for workplace discrimination and harassment, and has handled the largest wage and hour class and collective action ever been brought in several states, including Florida, Illinois, and New York. He's the author of no fewer than eight books on the law, has served as a legal commentator on PBS, NPR, MSNBC, CNBC, and US talk radio. And his comments have appeared in such publications as the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, and USA Today. Jerry was also recently honored by ALM to be selected as the author of the newest version of its publication entitled Class Actions, The Law of 50 States, which is a flagship publication of ALM devoted to class action law and practice. And he's been the recipient of the Law 360 MVP Award in Employment Law. And in this past year was the eighth award he's received by Law 360 since 2013. Winners of this accolade have distinguished themselves among their peers by securing impressive successes in high stakes litigation, complex global matters and record-breaking deals. And if I have that count right, you have received more Law 360 MVP awards than any other attorney in the United States. Just let that sit there for a moment. Isn't that amazing? Finally, Chambers has selected Jerry as one of the nation's leading class action defense lawyers from 2006 through 2023. And in its rankings, Chambers has stated, quote, Jerry Matman is absolutely phenomenal close quote, and is one of the top class action minds in the country. So with that background, I'd like to turn it over to um, Keith, then Jen, and then Jerry. And each will provide their thoughts and analysis for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have a Q&A session. So with that, please enjoy. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Matt and Tom. And it is our honor to have Keith with us today. We're going to have a little bit of a Q&A with him. And remember, you're speaking with the EOC. And when the EOC talks like the old EF Hutton commercial, people listen. It's coming right from Washington, D.C. So, Keith, let's get right into it. In 2023, the EOC's litigation activity was ratcheted up from its previous slowdown. What do you attribute to the increase in the lawsuits and what does it mean for corporate America? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dwayne Morris, for hosting this and Jennifer and Jerry for putting together this year's class action review. This is a quite the book. If you see how if you're in the room, you can see how physically big it is. But, you know, in reviewing it, uh, it's really helpful for us at the government, too, that you put your resources into this. And it, it, even reading it, I see trends that you've extrapolated from it that we may not have seen in DC. So we really appreciate this public service you do um, by putting it out there for us to look at too. So um, to your question about litigation, let's just take a step back as, as a whole and my thoughts on 
the government uh, litigating. You know, the EEOC is an agency that has its own independent litigating authority. And, you know, we have an important mission to prevent and remedy employment discrimination. And we have limited resources, just like all other agencies. So when we litigate, unlike class action lawyers or other plaintiff's lawyers or private entities, or even states, you know, we have nationwide or even global impact on the policies and procedures that we're bringing cases on. And it shows where we're prioritizing our efforts when we go as far as actually using federal resources to bring a case in federal court very much in the public. So I, my time in government, I've always tried to steer away from litigation, from government litigation. I've always thought it should be um, the last resource that we should use. You know, and first we should start with compliance assistance and giving both employers and employees all the tools they need. Number one, for employees to know what their rights are, to be able to tell their employer that they may be violating them before you know anything has to come to the government. And for employers too, who have to come who has to deal and comply with these complicated federal employment laws, giving them all the resources. So, you know, when you're seeing a significant shift in the amount of cases um, that are being brought, which from, you know, your report last year was 97 to 144. I mean, that's pretty significant in the sense. Does that mean there's a lot more employment discrimination going on that the EEOC has to use its resources? And the answer, you know, my opinion, just looking at the charge statistics, which is administrative and a little different. No, that's just showing um, where the agency is now focusing its resources, and that's litigating um, more significantly than it has before. And, you know, what does that send? What kind of message does that send to the regulated community? That means we're going to litigate at all costs. We're going to potentially litigate first and have less compliance assistance, less guidance, and going back to where we've seen patterns with these government agencies, both the Department of Labor and the EEOC, saying, you know, we'll tell you what's happening. We'll tell you what our trends are. We'll tell you um, where we believe enforcement should be and priorities on certain policies or trends and discriminations once we see you in federal court. And, and in my own personal position, I'm only speaking on behalf of myself. There's five commissioners, not on behalf of the agency. That's not the way uh, we should be operating in a sense. And what you'd like to see is litigation numbers going down because that means more employers are complying with the law, number one, but also number two, the EEOC's mediation and conciliation process needs to work as it should. And I've been a very big advocate of having more cases mediated and the EEOC mediating cases um, throughout the charge life cycle. Uh, and there were some changes early on when I got there related to that and also conciliation. So I look at the, the increase of litigation as what's happening during the conciliation process what's happening during the mediation process, that it has to come to the federal government actually bringing these significant lawsuits. And then when the federal government litigates, you know, it certainly um, litigates. And we have excellent lawyers um, who will handle these cases and take it all the way. And, you know, the, the drawback of that essentially, where I start is that you're not going to know essentially what the EEOC wants you to have done before to prevent this until you have litigation, appeals, final judgments down the road. And that doesn't help anyone. That doesn't help the employers who are trying to comply. And worse, it doesn't. Just delaying them getting the wages or, or uh, any kind of damages that they're entitled to down the line. So that's just my general thought of it, you know, to see these numbers so drastically increase and also see how they change significantly um, with the change of dynamics in, in DC. I mean, you know, if you, and I know you're gonna be covering this in a slide um, later on, it's just when these cases were filed and you see a huge increase and, I, and I'll sneak peek of the chart, you'll see, and maybe I won't be able to control myself and chime in then. Um, you know, and what does that mean politically? You know, when there is a change of dynamic, when there is a full slate of commissioners, and then suddenly the amount of cases that come to the commission for authorization spikes significantly. And as commissioners, we don't control what cases come to us. We can only vote up or down on the cases that are referred to us for litigation. So even in the patterns of when cases are coming with some of the changes in the commission, are also significant for employers 
in employees to be looking at. Keith, changing gears a bit, the biggest development with the highest factor of unknowns the past couple of years is the impact of artificial intelligence in the workplace and how it will affect the legal world. Can you share your thought leadership and insights on where you see the EEOC's focus with respect to addressing AI in the workplace? Yes, if you want me to hog the rest of the presentation and not hear from either of you. <laughs> so, you know, in, in a nutshell, more related to the litigation, you know, I've spoken, there's a lot written about AI and HR and how it can um, help eliminate uh, employment discrimination, how it can help eliminate bias by removing the human, but also at the same time, how it can scale discrimination if not properly um, used. And there's a lot of different legal theories you can go under under existing law relating how these cases are going to be brought. You know, is it data set discrimination where you're going to have essentially garbage in, garbage out, where, you know, the models or the employment pool is going to be made up of one race, one gender, one national origin, and that's what the computer is going to think is the most prevalent factor to make that decision? Or are you going to have a very diverse pool and then somebody's going to go in there and inject their bias into the algorithm and be able to scale discrimination more than any one human can do? But, you know, that's been talked about, that's been a lot written about. But I think to, relevant to this conversation today is the litigation around artificial intelligence and why haven't we seen these cases yet? You know, you see the statistics out there. Employers are using it. There's th thousands of HR tech AI products. Everyone wants to integrate this as quickly and fast as possible. But where's the law enforcement action going to be? And, you know, it's, it's a tough question to answer in the sense where we a, a large part of the reasons we haven't seen these cases is that employees don't know that they're being subject to these tools during an interview, during the application process, during your employment to see if you're going to get promoted, to see if you're going to get uh, what your salary is, to see if you're going to get demoted across the board. And without the employees knowing that they're being subject to this tool, it's very difficult for them to exercise their civil rights if they believe they've been violated by one of these tools. And that's really the difficulty in this whole equation here is that, you know, at what point are employees, applicants going to understand the tools, the systems that are being used against them or, you know, to assist them either way you want to look at it. And people look at it in, in varying um, ways, you know, and, and until we see that, and, you know, obviously employers from a federal perspective are not any under any obligation to say, here's the exact tool we're using, just like when human decision-making with employment assessments, they may not know the exact models that are being used against them when they were in um, pen and paper um, for employment assessments. So, you know, until we see a change in laws and, and what you're seeing is from a state and local perspective, from cities, from states, even from foreign governments that are going to start or start already regulating this area, is that push for disclosure is that push for number one, consent when you're using these tools. Number two, the employer needs to tell you exactly, you know, what vendor they're using, how the tools are going to assess you and have more access to that or even opting out, which is where you're seeing some of these state law proposals are going. You know, until you see that, you're just not going to see these kind of cases going forward. Now, employers can obviously voluntarily do that um, themselves. Um, and that may or may not be happening. I don't really know in that sense. But when that happens, maybe then somebody will say, well, I didn't get this job. Um, maybe it was a bad interview and the interviewer didn't like me. Or, you know, I also know that I was subject to these algorithmic tools during the interview. And maybe that's why. But even then, it's still going to be difficult from a law enforcement perspective because it's not going to come in as algorithmic discrimination. We don't have a box on our charge forms, which you've all seen, for AI discrimination, very much like we didn't have a box for COVID discrimination, right? Everyone wanted to know how COVID impacted the workforce. Tell us about our COVID charges. Well, it's not going to come in as a COVID charge. It will come in as a, a religious charge related to the vaccine or an ADA charge related to accommodations in that sense. And that requires us to then go do an investigation. Well, so you all know we get 70 plus thousand charges every single year. And for us to kind of home in on that one, say, well, this age case, it must be because of AI, you know, we have to actually um, go and do an investigation on that. So even from our perspective, 
the cases aren't going to come in clearly saying I was discriminated because of an algorithm. I was discriminated because of my age, my sex, my national origin. And then it just takes more time and effort. So that's, a, I think, the number one reason why we haven't seen these cases. And as you know, you see state laws or foreign laws that, that um, global employers are going to start to comply with may change. Employees may know more what um, they were subject to and be more willing to bring these claims if they believe they were discriminated against. Keith, um, one of the attributes of being a trusted advisor for our clients is keeping them out of the courthouse, keeping them out of trouble. The EOC in its new enforcement plan has designated equal pay, fair pay, pay transparency as a critical imperative. And yet the numbers of Equal Pay Act cases are very, very tiny. And there seems to be a disconnect in the message of the EOC. What's your opinion or your analysis of what's going on in that particular space? Well, from everywhere, from the White House to the uh, EEOC, the Department of Labor, you know, everyone wants to solve the pay gap. Everyone wants to be involved and have the EEOC um, bring these cases. And, you know, as you know, from a very technical standpoint, because there's a lot of lawyers in these rooms, these cases are very hard um, to bring under the Equal Pay Act or even under Title VII. So, you know, putting aside, you know, the legal issues, I think, you know, the continued push and obviously the U.S. women's soccer team litigation that made global news and, you know, a lot of the uh, push now for pay transparency and other pay laws across the board are going to continue to raise awareness of this. It's in the EEOC's strategic enforcement plan. It's a priority for everyone in D.C. You know why? Because pay discrimination has been illegal before. <laughs> The EEOC existed, you know, the Equal Pay Act was in 1963 before a Title VII. So, you know, I think you're going to see a continued push um, out of D.C., out of state capitals to try to lessen the pay gap. And a lot of that is going to be done um, through uh, pay transparency laws that we don't have at the EEOC. Um, there was an executive order this week about federal contractors requirements and pay transparencies. So I think, you know, you again, you, you'll see the state's. Uh, and uh, local governments take the lead on pushing for pay transparency, which then might increase the amount of charges we get um, related to equal pay or pay violations under Title VII. But it's certainly uh, an area, especially with um, the continued um, expectations that the EEOC will be doing a pay data collection at some point uh, in the future. We don't have enough time to go into component two of pay data from um, 2016 through um, 2019, but you know, I know in DC people are looking for creative ways to have more uh, pay transparency, whether it's through paid data collection or or through job advertisements, um, and then trying to get to the root of equal pay issues, which ultimately will lead to ESC charges and litigation. Keith, are there any other highlights from fiscal year 2023 or the strategic enforcement plan that you think employers need to understand in order to stay compliant? Yeah, I think that if you look at you know where the charge trends are going, which are separate from um, the litigations, obviously the litigations, the general counsel's office picks and chooses what cases they refer to the commission for us to approve to be filing. So that's very much driven um, internally by the EEOC with all the charges. But if you look neutrally at the charges coming in, you know, consistently retaliation is the number one charge of discrimination in the United States. But as you all know, that's tagged on to other claims. Putting that aside, uh, it's disability discrimination. And if you look at the trends in disability discrimination, which has been there for a while, the types of disability discrimination is changing significantly. And you're seeing a shift from um, what traditionally you would think about as uh, disability discrimination, you know, physical or medical issues that require accommodations to mental health. And I think that's really where a lot of the change in cases that we get and which will then lead to changes in the litigations we bring will be related to, to mental health. And charges related to anxiety, depression, and PTSD have been going up significantly year after year. And that's where a lot of claims are going. And I think that's being driven by a few things. One, uh, just the general awareness of mental health in the workplace, the younger generations of workers being more willing to talk about it and actually go request accommodations. But the bigger issue that I see, you know, looking in the crystal ball to this year, um, if you look from a few years ago, 
where we were with, you know, what is going to be the outcome of COVID, then you saw the vaccine related religious cases and some of the early accommodation cases. Well, here with mental health, a lot of that's going to be related to return to the office. And as more and more companies have that push to return to the office to get back to the normal pre COVID world, um, you're going to see employees making requests to work from home. And there's, you know, there's, uh, a way to get an accommodation, not by saying, well, I just like working home from home more. You know, I, I don't want to come to the office. I don't want to commute versus, you know, I have anxiety about going on the subway and catching the next um, disease. I have anxiety about rising crime in cities. I have anxiety or I'm depressed thinking about going back to the way it used to be in the office um, and having to commute and having to be around colleagues um, even though before the pandemic, if you don't, you didn't go to the office, you'd generally be fired. So in, in a sense now where you're seeing when employees are saying that HR departments need to be engaging in the interactive process um, at the outset, because if you don't do that, there's very little defense to get into. And maybe some of the fear or hesitancy that that's going to um, prevent employee or ease from getting back into the office when your board or CEO is demanding that, you know, can certainly have an impact on the, uh, on the initial claims coming in. But even so, just going through that process, that interactive process, um, the answer may not always be remote work. You know, we have guidance on our website that we, for, or the job accommodation network at the Department of Labor has, you know, a lot of different accommodations per different type of um, mental health issues. So, you know, it may not be just working from home forever. It may be coming in at different times. It may be noise canceling headsets or lower lights. So, you know, just the engaging in that process, employers shouldn't be fearful of number one, because they have to. And number two, when you engage in it um, properly, you know, it may lead to a different accommodation than the employee expected, but not even getting there with the influx of these potential accommodations that you had never seen before because the people were coming in the office. Um, you have to take those very seriously. And I do believe that's going to, and we have numbers, you know, maybe not specifically related to return to the office, but just in general, how anxiety, depression, and PTSD claims are going up, which I believe will lead to litigation. And I think a lot of that will be centered around these return to office policies. Thank you. Well, that sets the table nicely. What we'd like to do in our remaining time is go through the trends that we analyze. So the 650 page book represents about 5,075 hours worth of time of our class action team. What we do is every day in the morning and in the evening, look at every class action filing in all 50 states and all federal courts. We do that in the evening. The class action world never rests. Actually, this year there were rulings on Easter Sunday and Christmas Day, believe it or not, by judges. We analyze those, put them into a database, which now has over 25,000 cases. And we use those to peer around the corner and give our clients an idea of those future trends and risks that are evolving as they do business in all of these jurisdictions. And so what Jen and I are going to do is distill all of those hours and that work and that analysis into the 10 essential trends that we think are gonna drive class action litigation and drive risks and exposures for corporate America uh, in the coming year. So the very first one that we look at are class action settlements. Why does this matter? Why do we look at it? These results are very venue driven the cost, for instance, of settling a class action in California is a very, very different proposition than settling one in North Dakota. It's very impact driven uh, because I'm a believer in a truism that I call success begets copycats. When plaintiffs do well and pull down big settlement numbers and there are press releases about it and the world in which we look at individuals, consumers, workers are reading about it on their iPhone and thinking about their own personal circumstances. And talented, innovative, good plaintiff's lawyers are moving into that space to cash in on these settlements. You see more cases and that occurred in 2023 in terms of the volume of filings uh, because of the high settlement levels in 2022. So success begat more cases, more filings. It also drives up settlement numbers. The amount of demands go up based on analogous settlements. Uh, and you're starting to see the uh, nuclear verdicts in single plaintiff cases. 
sometimes uh, eight figure verdicts. You're seeing social inflation factors impacting uh, the amounts of these settlements. I teach the trial practice course at Northwestern University School of Law. One of our uh, units is about how to pick a juror. We talk about the difference in uh, someone who gets their news off their iPhone as compared to someone who reads about it in the newspaper, if anyone does that anymore, and how you select jurors and the notion of the angry juror uh, post-COVID and what's going on. And so all of these things drive these settlement numbers. So what did we see? We saw 10 class action settlements over the past year of over $1 billion. Five or seven years ago, 10 years ago, we'd see one of those about every eight years. We saw 10 this past year. We saw uh, 14 the year before. So coupled together, we have $24 billion class action settlements over the last 24 months. We track all major areas that corporate litigants are involved in, and five of those areas saw massive upticks, 25 billion products liability, 11 billion antitrust, 5 billion securities, 3 billion consumer fraud, 1 billion for privacy violations. We also track and have tables in the book on the top 10 settlements in the all areas of law and those totaled 47 billion. Year before, 66 billion. So we have 133 billion over the last 24 months. This data suggests that we just witnessed an unprecedented transfer of wealth in the United States. If you put a million dollars in a Brink truck and had the Brink's truck deliver it throughout America, there'd be 113,000 Brink trucks. That's $4.7 billion per month, $154 million a day, $6 million per hour that have been paid in class action settlements in the last two years. What our data suggests is that corporations have now entered a new era that we would call heightened risks and higher stakes, and the data doesn't lie. And so this is the playing field on which corporate America finds itself in the class action arena uh, in this year. Jen, how about privacy? Trend number two. Thanks, Jerry. So our track at our second trend that we discuss in the book relates to privacy litigation. So class action litigation in the privacy space continued to generate a multitude of filings in 2023. It continued to reign as one of the hottest areas of growth in terms of activity by the plaintiff's class action bar. That growth covers a few different areas. First, Illinois. The Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, otherwise called the BIPA or BIPA, its technical requirements, coupled with these stiff statutory penalties and fee shifting, provided a recipe for increased activity by the plaintiff's class action bar. Illinois was on the forefront of enacting privacy legislation, rendering it the birthplace, if you will, of a model that we expect other states to continue to follow. Although the law in Illinois was enacted in 2008, it operated largely under the radar uh, until filings accelerated in about 2017 and 2018, and then surged in 2022. By 2022, companies saw five times as many lawsuits in this area as they had seen the prior, the prior year and more lawsuit filings than they had seen in 2008 to 2018 combined. Now looking at the slide, at the outset of 2023, two seminal decisions by the Illinois Supreme Court bolstered filing numbers by increasing the damages potentially available to plaintiffs who bring these lawsuits. The first decision was a case called Tim's, where the Illinois Supreme Court decided that a five-year statute of limitations applies to the BIPA. The second and potentially more significant decision was in a case called Cothron versus White Castle, where the Illinois Supreme Court decided that a claim accrues with each collection 
or each disclosure of biometric data. As the chart reflects, filing spiked in the wake of these two rulings and remained elevated throughout the year. Our preliminary look at January of 2024 shows that those filings have remained elevated at this level. Outside of Illinois now, plaintiffs continued to attempt to leverage the laws of many other states, including laws in the privacy, anti-surveillance, and wiretap areas to attack innovative technologies around the country. For instance, in 2023, we saw a barrage of filings under a law called the Video Privacy Protection Act, or the VPPA, showcasing their creativity. Uh, the plaintiff's class action bar used this law to attack um, videos online, um, alleging that companies that maintain videos online track the videos that users watch and then share that information with third parties violated this statute. In 2024, we expect that uh, the plaintiff's class action bar will continue to showcase its creativity in invoking other types of pre-existing laws to challenge the use of technologies outside the contemplated scope, leading to higher settlement demands and probably more filings as well. Jerry, you want to talk about trend number three? Our third trend is what uh, we analyze class certification rulings. I call this the success scorecard. A case is filed, the plaintiff's attorney converts it into a certified case and subsequently monetizes that certified case into a large settlement. We read every class certification ruling that comes down in a year. Um, it's organized by venue, by circuit, by type of case, and all these statistics are displayed within the uh, findings of the report. The success scorecard this year was 72%, slightly down from last year, but think about it. Basically, seven out of 10 or three out of four cases are being certified by federal judges, state court judges. Why is this important? Class certification is the holy grail in this area of law. It's the make or break moment and the inflection point in these cases. If the motion is beaten, and the case is not certified as a class action, it fractures, fritters away, goes away. Corporation rarely, if anything, is paying much in the way of money, but lose that motion and the case is certified and very, very dangerous proposition to try that case. You could probably count on one hand the number of companies that are trying class actions before a jury. The stakes are just so large. So certification numbers drive settlements. So we tracked them in all the areas, and it's very telling to look at the statistics. The highest ones are securities fraud at 97% or ERISA at 82%, uh, wage an hour 75, those are all above the medium. And then you have the jump balls, discrimination cases and Warren Act cases that are around 50, 55%. And then somewhat incongruously, data breach cases were at 16%. And data breach cases, nonetheless, in 2023, exploded, and many were brought, many of those cases now on appeal. So um, Jen's going to talk a little bit about data breach and our explanation of what's going on. So if you're uh, a defendant and you're looking at the 22% or 28%, how do I move into the circle of success? How do I fracture? How do I break these cases? And I'd say all these cases are like real estate. Location, location, location is all important. They're judge driven, they're venue driven, they're circuit law driven, knowing that the standards are in flux, knowing the latest rulings, knowing your judge and taking advantage of every analytic that is available out there for those who are looking up. Good solid lawyering puts you in those that circle of success to be able to fracture those cases and, and get out of these uh, loops of just endless expenditure of money in these particular areas. Data breaches. 
Thanks, Jerry. Our next trend relates to data breach class actions. So the volume of data breach class actions, as Jerry mentioned, just exploded in 2023, despite their somewhat unique challenges and inconsistent outcomes. Data breach has emerged as one of the fastest growing areas of class action litigation. After every major and probably not so major data breach, companies are seeing the filing of one or more class action lawsuits. In 2023, we often saw these filings across multiple jurisdictions, whether it be copycat filings or follow-on class actions. As the slide illustrates, the numbers in 2023 surged as compared to 2022 in prior years. During the first half of 2023 alone, plaintiffs filed as many data breach class actions as they filed during the entirety of 2022. Now, as I mentioned, these filing numbers continue to persist despite the mixed results that the plaintiffs saw over the course of the year. These mixed results are fueled primarily by disagreement among the courts in terms of what constitutes a concrete injury sufficient for a plaintiff to maintain a cause of action. Um, in other words, is an unauthorized access to personal data enough without an actual misuse of that data? Courts continue to disagree and grapple with these and similar questions. Those plaintiffs who then clear the statutory standing hurdle as to their own claims faced a larger and more daunting obstacle at the class certification stage um, where they struggled to show class-wide injury. As Jerry mentioned, the plaintiffs in 2023 prevailed in only 16% of class certification rulings issued throughout the course of the year. This shows somewhat that the architecture of a successful class action in the data breach space is still a work in progress. Given the um, ease with which the plaintiffs have been able to file and settle these suits though, we don't expect them to go anywhere in 2024, but we do expect that standing will continue to occupy a center stage role in the litigation of these claims. The next trend relates to the Supreme Court. So the United States Supreme Court has traditionally defined the playing field for class action litigation by impacting and shifting the landscape. This past year did not disappoint. In June, the court issued a ruling in a case called Students for Fair Admissions versus President and Fellows of Harvard College holding that two colleges, the University of North Carolina and Harvard, that considered race as a factor in their admissions process violated equal protection. That ruling sparked a wave of claims by plaintiffs and advocacy groups against other colleges, as well as against private employers and law firms, many of which targeted diversity, equity, and inclusion, or DEI programs, as allegedly providing unlawful race-based preferences. Some of our law firm clients in particular that come to us for workplace counseling advice uh, receive demand letters targeting their fellowship programs. The impact of the Students for Fair Admissions ruling continues to unfold. Two days ago, the University of North Carolina agreed to pay $4.8 million to settle the suit against it. Uh, which was earmarked to cover the fees and expenses of the advocacy group that filed the case, really adding to the group's war chest. Um, last Friday, that group uh, also asked the Supreme Court to intervene in its case against West Point and to reverse the lower court's refusal to grant a preliminary injunction to block its consideration of race and admissions while the parties litigate the merits of the lawsuit. So as the uncertainty continues to percolate in this area and courts start to weave their patchwork quilt of rulings, this uncertainty is likely to continue to fuel filings uh, in the upcoming year. Our next trend relates to PAGA. 
In 2023, companies saw PAGA filings reach an all-time high. PAGA, of course, refers to the California Private Attorneys General Act, which creates a scheme that allows a private citizen to step into the shoes of the state to sue his or her employer for violations of the California Labor Code on behalf of other allegedly aggrieved employees. So even though these suits are representative in that a plaintiff can represent other aggrieved employees, the plaintiff need not satisfy Rule 23, which allows the plaintiff to harness the leverage of a class action, if you will, without meeting those pesky burdens. The number of PAGA notices has increased exponentially over the past two decades, growing from about 11 notices in 2006 to over 7,700 in 2023. These surges in filings, which are illustrated on the slide, correspond fairly closely with developments on the arbitration front. As the adoption of workplace arbitration programs gained popularity as a mechanism to prevent employees from pursuing class and collective actions, plaintiffs identified workarounds. In 2014, the California Supreme Court solidified PAGA as the front runner in terms of a workaround when it held that representative action waivers in the PAGA context are unenforceable. That decision resulted in a significant uptick in filings of PAGA notices in that year. Although the PAGA movement suffered a setback in 2022, as we discussed when we were here last year with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Viking River, that setback was short-lived. This past year, the California Supreme Court relegated that Viking River decision to more of a front-end hurdle to these cases rather than a bar. In other words, even though an employee who signs an arbitration agreement now can be compelled to arbitrate his individual PAGA claim in arbitration, if that employee either prevails or settles his claim, he can return to state court and pursue the representative portion of his PAGA claim. This development is reflected in these filing numbers that we see in front of us in 2023 where we hit an all-time high in terms of PAGA notices. As we embark on 2024, notably employers already have suffered their first significant setback in the PAGA realm um, in January when the California Supreme Court issued its decision in Estrada, removing manageability as one of the key defenses. As a result, we expect PAGA to be even more popular than ever as we head into 2024, making California ground zero for arbitration workarounds. Our seventh trend was the table setting trend that we talked about with Keith. Uh, but the takeaway I would have here is that although is, this is not a class action, it looks like it, feels like it, and presents an exposure to a corporation like at the case that Tom had mentioned, the largest EEOC case that we were involved in at 77,000 claimants in all 50 states. And so it lives and breathes and presents just like a class action. So these are very challenging to a business organization. We track Department of Justice filings, Department of Labor filings, EEOC filings. And the uh, this chart talks about the uh, lower numbers in the beginning of the Biden administration and now in 2023, quite an extent, uh, expansion of those numbers, which coincides with a full complement of commissioners that sit at the EOC with Keith and are now um, in place to effectuate the labor uh, antitrust enforcement uh, worker friendly policies of the Biden administration. So by my book, you're going to see more lawsuits. You're going to see bigger lawsuits in 2024. In my world, there was a very significant event that occurred on Friday night at about 9.30, Friday, uh, September 29. And for the first time, the EEOC issued a press release, and it was a remarkable press release because it said, here are the number of lawsuits we filed in 2023, our fiscal year. 
And this is the increase, and this is the amount of bigger systemic cases we've ever filed, in essence, touting how it spent the taxpayer dollars and putting corporate America on notice of what's coming down the pike. I don't control the press releases. Not my department. All right. <laughs> Next trend. AI. <laughs> Set the table a little bit here, too, with Jen. Some thoughts on that. Yeah. Uh, Keith already talked about this, so I'll just cover it briefly. Our eighth trend related to generative AI. So generative AI hit the mainstream in 2023 and quickly became one of the most talked about and debated subjects among corporate counsel and in boardrooms across the country is companies really jump to try to take advantage of generative AI while managing its risks. So suffice it to say that in 2023, we probably saw the tip of the iceberg relative to the ways that generative AI is poised to impact and potentially transform the class action space. AI, as Keith talked about, is already providing some fuel for attack as the plaintiff's class action bar tries to figure out who's using it and, and, and how to go about um, filing lawsuits and making money off of it. Um, but it's also increasing, especially generative AI, is increasing the bandwidth of plaintiff side law firms who now have the capacity to bring and prosecute class actions with fewer resources um, than ever before. Our ninth trend uh, involves environmental social governance class actions. I was privileged to go to London this year to speak as Dwayne Morris's representative at a three-day class action conference in Europe. And I was pestered with questions about what in the world's going on in the United States when the two presidential candidates during debates are talking about class actions and what can occur, and it seems like so many are brought. And yet, in some respects, European jurisdictions far ahead of the United States, especially in the ESG space and the sorts of theories and the sorts of claims where companies are being attacked for their advertising campaigns about going green or their supply chains not being fueled by slave labor in uh, third world countries, about uh, commitments to diversity and equality and workplace fairness and class actions being brought against directors and officers for allegedly failing to measure up to those social commitments. And I think that ESG is now the uh, coin of the realm in boardrooms. Uh, directors talking about it, certainly knowledge about, about it. And with this influx of innovative class action lawyers on the plaintiff side, thinking of different ways to strike gold, to bring cases against uh, large corporations, against their C-suite executives, against their outside directors. In my money, this is the area where the plaintiff's bar, bar is going to begin to put uh, their money and resources behind bringing these sorts of cases. So I think cases that we haven't seen before that we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg of uh, over the last two years are going to hit their stride in the rest of the decade and begin in 2024. So this is an area of risk that I think uh, probably is not getting enough uh, due in an area that we're working very, very hard with our clients to get ahead of these risks to make sure that any commitments are calibrated to what they can live up to and stay out of harm's way. So in our 10th trend, and to leave a little bit of time for questions, we should talk about some good news rather than kind of the rain clouds or the gray clouds out there. And the 10th trend is about the success of arbitration agreements as a litigation management tool uh, to avoid uh, these sorts of cases to save money and efficiently dispose of in a fair way uh, resolution of disputes between consumers and employees. And so uh, this is all as a result of the Epic Systems v. Lewis decision in 2018 that greenlighted the use of arbitration agreements with consumers, with employees that have class action waivers. And the stakes are very high. If you have one, we can make your class action go away maybe a phone call, maybe a letter, maybe a motion, but pretty quickly, 30, 60 days. If you don't have it, you're potentially facing millions of dollars of management time of corporate resources to, uh, devoted to defend one of these things. And so uh, no secret that probably 60 to 75% of corporate America is, has or is in the process of adopting these sorts of agreements. 
So we tracked every single arbitration decision in state and federal courts, and defendants won 66% this year. Pretty darn good. The one third that they lost is basically where they couldn't prove that the consumer, perhaps through a click wrap agreement or an employee, through an onboarding uh, document, actually knew of and agreed to and signed off on the arbitration agreement. Very rarely would a court say there's something untoward, unconscionable about the agreement. So this remains the very best defense uh, to a class action, very cheap to install it, uh, very quick, uh, and uh, it's there. But there are chinks in the armor. Uh, Congress uh, passed a law, President Biden signed it in March of 2022 to carve out sexual harassment claims. Not a lot of sex harassment class actions these days, but nonetheless, plenty of those sorts of claims, but that's off limits now for arbitration agreements. There have been laws introduced in Congress to put race, discrimination, and harassment claims outside of the uh, Federal Arbitration Act. Uh, that law exempts transportation workers. The Supreme Court this past year in the Saxon case uh, interpreted the how broad or how narrow that exemption should be. So every company in the transportation industry facing class actions is fighting through the Saxon uh, decision and whether or not they're in or outside of. But basically, this is the ground zero. This is the make or break moment in terms of getting out of these class actions. I think uh, in our own practice, we filed at last count 92 motions to compel arbitration. Luckily, we won 100% of them this year. They're in tough spots like California, but this is a big difference maker for corporations. So if one thing to take away from today, if you don't have one, it's worth kicking the tires on it, looking at it, maybe adopting of it because it can save a lot of heartache, uh, let alone millions of dollars. My prediction would be this is going to find its way into the presidential debate. It's somewhat political uh, in terms of left and right looking at it and whether or not it's good or it's not good public policy to allow these sorts of agreements to displace class actions in the consumer fraud and employment related spaces. So wait and see. But at least right now, it is probably the most viable defense, quickest acting defense, cheapest defense and best defense. Uh, to a class action. So in uh, 57 minutes, that's a tour of the class action world and 1,300 decisions and the trends that we see. And uh, we'd left a few minutes for uh, questions, but thank you so very much for, for listening. You're doing, you and Jen and your teams are doing incredible work, but the troops are either on the Zoom or here in the room. Uh, and I think everybody should wait, take away with their crowd. This, our employment group, this is a bit of a commercial, are incredible. Uh, the work that they do, the hard work, the dedication, uh, you are at the cutting edge, and, and Jerry and Jen and your teams have helped us get there. But those that are in the trenches working on all these matters should take away a little wave to the crowd, too. So, Eve, thanks for your leadership with this whole entire group. Um, of course, Jerry and Jen are the leaders of the uh, workplace uh, section of our broader ELPI group. But we're really proud of this group. Uh, I can say that I know you all are, too. So. Thank you. Just, should take a little wave to the crowd if you're part of that. Thank team. you. Uh, uh, don't be bashful. Briefly, there isn't one area of the best action practice that these two and the group doesn't know. I mean, every single issue that comes up, you know, in cases where you have to research it, they have handled it already. They know it and they can delve in. So they are true experts in this space. Thank, Thank you. Uh, I have a question for the commissioner. I like the way you had a little back and forth there with jury um from your part how long have you been a commissioner um, and how often are you in session i just am curious well since to, i was confirmed in 2020 and uh it wasn't you know the dynamics of the eoc uh, because it's an agency that has uh bipartisan uh, members like it's like it's structured like the nlrb the sec the ftc 
where you have Republicans and Democrats in, in our world, Republicans are management side, Democrats are uh, generally come from the employee side, just the breakdown of the backgrounds. So, you know, the dynamics of the commission through the end of 2022, it was a three two even two years into the Biden administration, it was a majority Republicans, just like during the Trump administration, it was majority Democrats for almost uh, almost the entire time. That dynamic shifted in 23. So for the first eight, nine months of 2023, it was a 2-2 two, two deadlock. Then in um, July of last year, the fifth commissioner was confirmed. And then I believe in October, September, the general counsel was confirmed. So now you're looking at the EEOC being at completely a full slate, five commissioners, and a uh, Senate confirmed general counsel um, as of you know this past fall. So I think that's why we talk about a lot of these trends. You see a lot of the increases um, that occurred with the political dynamics um, changing um, is why this agency is going to be very significant in this year, um, where you know you saw with the NLRB, with the FTC, other agencies that have had their majority within the Biden administration being very active. So I think the EEOC this year is going to be um, one on all of your radar in the employment group. So. Maybe this is for the commissioner, but but for Jerry and Jen as well. There's a tension between some of the cases that you see coming up through the National Labor Relations Board and the EOC, and the area where um, it might be a form of harassment in the workplace, maybe conduct that creates a hostile work environment. And the NLRB takes the seems to take the position that that's fair game under Section Seven of the NLRA for um, exercising your rights within the workplace to get in the face of your supervisor and um, deal with your workplace conditions. And yet some of that conduct seems to be something that would cross the line from the point of view of the EOC. And a lot of employers feel on this issue, they're in a catch 22 between the two agencies. Is there anything you can give us in terms of insight guidance on how an employer practically deals with the tension between those two things? Well, certainly a very hot um, political issue when it comes to uh, uh, Section 7 rights, uh, generally in the NLRA um, and uh, union organization, which obviously you've seen a lot of news stories and how that interacts uh, with Title 7 and employers' obligations under uh, Title 7 to have an environment that is uh, free of harassment and having policies to prevent um, all that kind of conduct from not occurring in the workplace, even during a union drive. And there's certainly a conflict with the change in dynamics at the NLRB with rescission of some uh, policies that was very uh, clear on this and going to a different standard. So that has led a lot of people to inquire about the EEOC um, and the NLRB coming together to synthesize um, some of this. So, you know, I am always for more clarification, as you heard in the beginning, I think that uh, employers and uh, everyone from employers to union organize, organizers to employees need to know um, what their rights are, but really for the employers in this situation who are undergoing um, union activity to know when uh, their employees uh, cross the line into harassing and can take remedial action like they could against uh, any other employee. So I'm hopeful, you know, that the agencies come together, you know, my own personal opinion, again, not on behalf of the commission, you cannot use this in your cases, but, you know, nowhere in Title VII, is there an exception uh, for sexual harassment or uh, race discrimination or any other type of unlawful conduct just because there's a, a union drive? And I think, um, you know, Title VII is obviously one of the most important civil rights laws we have, the ability to be in the workplace and, and not be uh, harassed or discriminated against a protected characteristic. And, uh, you know, the tension there with it, it's okay because it's during a union drive just doesn't exist. So you see there's really uh, extreme positions that um, have been taken on this issue. And I think employers and employees deserve uh, clarification on this. And I, and as an EEOC commissioner, it's important that uh, companies have policies and procedures in place to prevent harassment wherever it occurs. So. Yes, sir. Thanks for uh, taking time, Jerry, Jen, the team, just kudos on a great effort. This is going to be a great tool for clients and for folks at the firm. Question to the two of you, though. I know you're looking at this stuff 24-7. You live it, breathe it. 
But is there anything there that really surprises you at the end of the day when you take all the data, you look at it and say, oh, my God, I didn't see that. Is there anything that's really jumps off the page to you as surprising? What surprises me is the impact the U.S. Supreme Court has. And maybe if it's a 5-4 vote, think about the impact that one person's vote can have. And so you see it in the data breach area where inevitably there's a data breach and the next day there's a class action, but the plaintiffs are only winning 14% of it. And that's because of the decision in the TransUnion case decided, I think, 6-3 by a Supreme Court majority that basically is creating an impediment or wall. And it's unlike any other area of class action litigation. But that occurred in 2011 with Dukes v. Walmart. It took the plaintiff's bar about five years to learn how to get around, reboot, change their architecture. So uh, I wouldn't put any credence in it's always going to be that low. The plaintiff's bar is nothing but innovative and creative, and they're going to find a way. And that's why I think companies obviously need good, tough defense lawyers to stand up to that. Well, I don't want to stand between our cocktails. I know they're outside there. Thank you all so very much for coming.